Okay, I'm going to watch the time. We have a lot of really cool stuff um, to talk about. And a lot of it has to do with change. Uh, the web really has changed everything we do. It is hard to find something that the web has not touched. And the fact that we are so sort of ultra connected right now, it's fascinating. All right. So uh, at 5 o'clock, I went down to the hotel bar tonight because I wanted to have a tiny little bite to eat before I came here. And it was just me and the nacho bar and the bartender. And we got to talking, and he had just purchased an iPod Touch. OK? And we can probably sum up my entire 50 minutes or so that I'm going to spend talking to you with what he said about how he felt about this device. He said, I have this cool app. I have this cool app. I have my music, which he was playing into the stereo in the bar. And he said, I have a world of information in my hand. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm lecturing tonight at the library school. <laughs> And I will be sharing with everyone what you just said. And I, I told him I would come back and, and see him and tell him how it went. But he's not a library person. He's a guy on the street. And that's his take on the world of information and portable devices and where we are right now. So really, that's what that's all about. Isn't it amazing that three, these three social networks get 250 million visitors a month? Facebook leads sharing. 24% of the, that, uh, the, of the folks that I believe it was Forrester or businessinsider.com talked to, 24% said, I share on Facebook, I share via email, and I share via Twitter, and then all these other smaller ones. And this blew my mind. This is one of my students. Uh, I teach a class called LIS 768, Participatory Service and Emerging Technologies, and I assign a book report, where they read a book that's kind of out in the world, and then they relate it to course content. Megan put this up on the Twitter, and she used uh, a tag that identifies that it's about the class. So I got to see it. And she says she's reading Born Digital on her Kindle. How do you cite a Kindle book? because there are no page numbers. I had never, ever processed that before. I had never thought that that, and so we found it. You know, APA now has, has a web page that tells you how to cite your Kindle. It's amazing. What do we do when uh, our classrooms look like this? And I'm sorry, that's a little hard to see. Uh, but everybody has a laptop. What do we do with these things? Have you seen these around? With our phones, we can, our camera phone, you can scan this and it gives you information. Might link up to the web. Augmented reality, where I point my camera phone at the landscape and it tells me little bits of information. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. So here's some of the challenges that we face. Uh, some of the ones I see, public perception, for sure. Public perception of libraries, of the way libraries work, public perception of our governing bodies when it's sometimes time to make cuts, right? OCLC found that people start with search engines. They talked to 3,000 people all over the world. And they found that 84% of them go to the Google. 1% go to the library website. I spent 15 years working in public libraries before I started at UNT with Dr. Sam. And, uh, I spent three of those years chairing the website redesign committee. <laughs> Never, ever, ever take three years to do anything with your website. There is, you don't, have an, you don't have the time to do that. Because the minute you take that long, everything will have changed like three times over. If you're going to do it, do it in six months. We have this going on as well. And this is uh, one of the examples out of Ohio. This is the Toledo Library website. Where they put this on the, if you went to ToledoLibrary.org, this is what you saw before you got to the website. Very serious stuff. Charlotte Mecklenburg has been back and forth. It was like a punch in the stomach when I read that online that morning that they had done, that they were getting ready to do those uh, cuts. Even more challenges. You know, technology really is a challenge. There's just so much. And knowing the, the right decisions to make and the right things to do with technology. And then there's techno lust, right? Technolust is wanting technology in your library because it's so cool. Okay, now it's okay to have personal technolust. I have a high degree of that. 
<laughs> but institutional techno lust, you want to keep that under control. Okay, don't, don't, especially if you're in an administrative position, don't say let's buy X for everybody in the building because it'll make them better workers. We don't know that it will. Be careful how you spend your money. Then there's techno stress. How much of this stuff can we have coming at us? The Twitter and the Foursquare and the Gowalla and the everything else. Ooh, and the technophobia. Now some libraries are plagued with this one. And if it's up top in the administrative ladder, you're in trouble. Because we need to be moving. We need to plan, but we need to be moving. This can freeze a library. It can like freeze it in time. Dangerous. Come on, clicker. Other problems, institutional culture. How folks uh, think about technology and how they think about users. Uh, the conference I was at in Holland was called the User Experience. Uh, and I was introduced by a Stevie Nicks impersonator. It was the craziest thing. There was a fog machine. and They, they do it up over in Holland. It was amazing. Uh, silos of knowledge. How many of you are coming from libraries, that you're actively working in libraries? OK. And you don't have to raise your hand for this part. Do you have people that have all the knowledge and they kind of keep it in their little spot? Would you say they're embedded staff? <laughs> Are they kind of holding their little kingdom and they know all the stuff and the minute they leave, you're in trouble? I think that's a problem. And mindset. A mindset about change, a mindset about in in innovation. Can I tell you a story about this one real quick? Let me have a sip of my tea. Doesn't this look like it's a big like beer? <laughs> it is not. This is an Arizona green tea, and it's the best thing I've found for my voice when I talk. OK, this is Jack. And he was a reference assistant at Columbus Metropolitan Library. They redesigned some of their reference desks to be these kind of open, stand-up kiosks. I loved it. I, I took his picture. I was talking to him. He was telling me what it's like. You might work across from somebody. You might stand beside them and sort of do that reference interview together. OK? At the same time that I was in Columbus seeing this really cool innovation in libraries, I got an email from a young man that I mentor in library school, which I think is, I, I love to do that. And he was working in an academic library. And he was doing two hours a week on the reference desk. And one day, he went to his reference desk and he decided that he wanted to sit out there. So he did that, he turned the computer around and he moved his chair around to this side and he sat and he talked to the students that way for two hours. And he answered their questions. 45 minutes later, he's sitting in his cubicle in the lower level of the library, and he received an email from the head of reference. And she said, dear, you were observed today doing this. And we don't do that here. Your services will no longer be needed on the reference desk. Thank you. Crushed. When this is going on, and they're trying to figure out the best way to meet users and to stand beside them and to kind of do co-discovery. We have that mindset that can kind of hurt us as well. Organizational structure, I really think the library of the future will be flatter, flatter than some of the institutions we have now. Barriers and rules, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. So what can we do? And here's the slide where I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you about. We can do all of these things. And what I will do in the next bit of time is take you through these. The first one is break down barriers. Samuel Green said, librarians, make people feel welcome and personalize their service. Do you know when he said that? 1876, in the very first issue of American Library Magazine, which became Library Journal. We're still talking about this. And I was just in Holland talking about this. We are still talking about just this. Uh, this is Wondrous. It's an art installation at the Tucson Library, the Pima County Public Library. Uh, I think they do a good job of encouraging their visitors. Let's take a look at some of the ways that we talk to our users, though in our libraries. Uh, classic, classic sign, 
no cell phones. And we've already seen examples tonight of what uh, a cellular device or a converged device can do for us way beyond just taking a call. What do you think? <laughs> I, I look to the public library to be a place where I could get some quick access, some free Wi-Fi, and hopefully, if I've had a whole bunch of tea, a bathroom to go to, right? <laughs> Especially when you're traveling. Amazing. This is uh, a high school library. No noise pollution. What part of quiet didn't you understand? Putting the little puppies on the sign does, really, does not make it friendly. <laughs> it amazes me. Here's an example from Australia. Uh, this was a, a remodel of a, a circulation return desk where they built a wall where you used to see a happy circulation person that would take your book. Now you see just a hand reaching <laughs> under. Not the friendliest way to do this. And I, I, I don't know exactly what they were trying to do, but they actually had to put a sign here that says, please take your inquiries in, you know, into the customer service desk. Amazing. I, I, used, I was in Australia last fall, and I, I did a talk. And this is kind of a fam infamous photo out on, on Flickr in the library, people talking about it. So I used it in my talk. I'm at this reception after my talk, and the, the guy that led the project that did this was there. And he came up to me, and he had to state, God bless him, he had to state his case. It's sort of uncomfortable. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't, that, that's hard to see. This says, Teen Central. Uh, this desk is for staff use only. Please do not remove uh, desk or chair. <laughs> Don't move the furniture. Uh, nobody was around here when I visited this library. Who, yeah, it's teen central, but don't touch anything. I don't even think about touching the chair because a librarian might come by and want to sit there. What do you think? Here we are at the director's lecture here tonight. Does anybody have a parking space? Maybe you don't want to come. What does this say when this is the first thing you see when you pull up to the public library? This is a designated quiet area. Do not move the furniture. Fascinates me, academic library. Uh, I visited an academic library in Sydney uh, where the, uh, the assistant dean had turned the lower level of the library over to the students, said, do whatever you want. There's some furniture, there's some tables. Do move, do, do whatever you want. And every few days, she would walk through with her pad and take some notes. Oh, they've configured a space for this. Oh, they were practicing presentations. And she's making notes because they're going to redo the library. And that's her way of seeing what the students are doing, instead of this and this. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so remember this. And in your library jobs, if you ever see somebody trying to tape that sign up on the wall, remember what Samuel Green said. And this is uh, Allen County Public Library. They, they replaced all the words uh, reference with ask here. What I suggest we do is perform a kindness audit of our spaces. When you get back to your libraries, go outside, come in the front door as you would a patron or a library user or a student, and look for the signals and the messages that we send our users, how we speak to them, how the desks look. Connect with users. Oh, Michael Buckland, yay. 1992, redesigning library services. And I use this in my dissertation, yay. Um, Michael Buckland said, with technology, and this was 92, this was long before everything we're talking about, there is greater potential to take the library to the user. A very simple, beautiful little statement that he saw in 92. Peter Block, in a wonderful book called Community, said, communities are human systems given form by conversations that build relatedness. Two key words from this slide, conversation and human. Two wonderful words. The District of Columbia Public Library is Twittering. And they're doing a really good job of it. And Twitter is a microblogging service, uh, for those of you that might not have seen it. They are responding to users. They are having that conversation that we saw on the, the uh, other slide. Now, this is a little overwhelming. This is a conversation prism from one of the social media guys, Brian Solis. This is all the different channels that we could have a conversation in right now out in the social web, social media, et cetera. It can be overwhelming, very overwhelming. 
Uh, but what I would suggest is pick and choose and look for the ones that people are using. Here's an example. Uh, I stay in Oak Park, Illinois when I'm teaching. I did a search on Twitter search for Oak Park Library. And you'll see this third one here, Esotericus says, disappointed to learn that the Oak Park Public Library is apparently woefully impoverished when it comes to books on graphic design. Oh, so he's saying something about the library. So I said to him, hey, did they contact you? And he says in reply, why yes they did, and quite surprisingly, they were very prompt about it. The experience helped me realize the benefits of Twitter. The library contacted him. And while I was asking him that, the Oak Park librarian stepped in and said, I contacted him, I did. <laughs> he has my email, he can send suggestions, and she passed everything to collection development. Who knew? Who knew that we could have this type of contact with our users? in this type of space. Uh, I was at the Albuquerque, uh, or New Mexico Library Association in Albuquerque last April, and uh, I found this in getting ready for that talk. Someone, just a random person that lives in Santa Fe, said to the world, really, via Twitter, uh, I'm headed off to the library, any suggestions for good reads? Who has the answer to that question? We do, the librarians. And there, I think there were people from Santa Fe that day in the room, and they didn't even know. Because if you're not following the conversation, it'll pass you by. And really, what we're talking about, when all the technology falls away, when all this stuff, whatever it is, the Twitter, the, the Foursquare, whatever, it really comes down to two people having a conversation, to two people talking to each other and being human. Next up, Facilitate User con Contribution. A wonderful book called Here Comes Everybody by Clay Shirky. Absolutely wonderful book. Uh, folks are out there, uh, and they are finding ways to contribute and make stuff. What I think we should do in libraries is give our users the tools to help build our collections and our services, and then to take a great big step back and get out of the way and let them do some things. And if you ask me what role we'll be playing in the future as librarians, I really see us as guides, not gate. It used to be, oh, this is our stuff. I'll let you look at it a little. It's ours. You can check it out for a week. We're keeping it. Guides, not gatekeepers. And we're really moving into this, this space of hyper locality. Have you heard this word? It's a great word. Hyper local. That's the idea that a neighborhood or a city has, has a presence online in some of these networks, and that there, there's information built up in very, like, block by block even. Let's take a look. A wonderful article out of uh, Library Journal, and this is a great phrase, geo-enriching online information. That's what users can do right now with some of these systems. Uh, this is a prototype. This is uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's home and studio in Oak Park. And I, I, just, I took this photo and I just made this as a mock-up of what we may see someday with a device. We hold a device up at, at uh, the home and studio, and little bubbles come up that say what this is, who lived there, information about the space, and uh, who could be in charge of this? Oak Park Library, in, in cooperation with the museum. Very, very, very interesting. Uh, we can tap into local creators to help them help us uh, create collections. One of the most important things we can do in our libraries is going to be this in the next few years. Because people go to the Google. And I'm very aware I say the the in front of everything. It's kind of this thing I do. But these are the things that are very, very unique to us. I was at the, uh, the Doc Library in Delft, Holland last week. Voted the most innovative, best library in the Netherlands. They have a Microsoft Surface table, which is one of these, yeah, these devices where it's like a giant iPhone, OK? You take your library card. You put it face down on the table. The table scans the card and says, oh, you live on something street. It pops up a map. It pops up historic photographs from the digital collections of what your street used to look like. And it lets you add what you would like to add to it. Fascinating. They put in a wall of video monitors in this library 
and it's the first step toward gathering the town's stories. They're going to have like a studio set aside where you can come in and tell the story of growing up there, how you lived there, what it was like, and that becomes part of this video wall of stories. It's fascinating. Local collections and local experts because those are the folks that know the, the history and story uh, of the town. And then there's the Foursquare. And yes, I'm the mayor of a few things uh, in Indiana and Illinois. Mm. And for the room, Foursquare is this silly game that you play on your phone, or you can play it on the web, I think, where you check in. The, geo, the GPS, whatever it is in your phone, figures out where you are. Oh, you're in the geography building, it said to me earlier. I said, yes, and I want to check in. So it checks in. It gives me points. It's a game. People like to get points, OK? <laughs> Pratt Library says, have you checked in at any Pratt location today on Foursquare? Become a mayor of a branch, this is fascinating, and earn a special surprise. So they're sort of leveraging a brand new tool, OK, uh, for the, the users. And then, OK, congratulations to Miha007. She won a mug. And see, checking in on Foursquare does have its advantages. So this is what their library looks like on Foursquare. Tells you who's been here. Not many folks, when this screenshot was taken, shows you where it's at. Uh, here's Skokie Public Library. Uh, this is Toby. He's actually a, 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 a a staff member, and look, he left a, a little tip about the, the, the space, the library. Need to use wireless network, look for access point called Skokie Link. So he's actually adding to the information space about this library, not at the library website that nobody goes to, that took three years to create, but here, <laughs> where folks may be checking in as they move through their lives. So this is what it looks like, and I am mayor of the library school. Yes, yay, and we actually have 20 iPod touches that we play with that I can bring in my class to do this stuff. If you check in a number of times, you get little badges. Again, people <laughs> like to get badges, right? So if you're a super user or, or you've been, you know, like you check in more than five times in an evening, they think you're out on a bender or whatever, so it's, it's kind of silly, it's kind of funny. Okay, so I go to a sushi place outside of Chicago, and I sit down, I check in, and this comes up. Foursquare says, oh, we know exactly where you are. And around the corner is a wine bar. And Jenny Levine says, it's pretty good stuff there at the wine bar. I actually know Jenny. She's a good friend of mine. It was so strange to see a, t a tip come up from her inside of the Foursquare environment. And again, she is contributing to the information, to the knowledge about these locations in this space. Another example, Gowalla, uh, very similar idea. You check in. It gets very interesting, and you get things like this when you check in and Panera Bread, whatever. It gets very interesting when you look at something they do called trips. There's a Frank Lloyd Wright tour that there are 10 spots they've identified inside of this app. There are 10 spots they've identified in the Chicagoland area that if you check in at all 10, you get a Frank Lloyd Wright badge. And you sort of learn a bit as you move around uh, of all the cool stuff that Frank Lloyd Wright did. This isn't like the neat museum site, and it's certainly not the library site. It's a mobile application that knows where you happen to be. This fascinates me. This is an augmented reality application on the iPhone. If I point it out the window at the Panera Bread, where I am the mayor, it shows me the nearest person tweeting. I have no idea what this is good for. I have no idea. And I should tell Marilyn Johnson, I was sitting by my campfire last summer up at the lake having my nice big glass of red wine, and I was tweeting. And some of the Twitter apps now have a thing where you can see nearby tweeters. There was somebody on the other side of the lake tweeting, too. It's amazing. OK, and then there's this. And I just got to show you. And what is this? Have you heard about this thing? What is this going to do? What is this going to do to the way people consume information? This is day three for me. Everybody in the room just kind of leaned forward a little bit. OK, Techn personal technolust is OK. All right? 
I, they were cleaning my room when I got back today, so I couldn't get in. So I sat in the lobby with this thing, and I was able to answer email, to write a blog post, to get on the web, to do all sorts of things in this sort of little space. Uh, it's fascinating. It is absolutely fascinating. Uh, somebody on Twitter said, this is not the future, but it's the first step toward the future. So keep that in mind as well. These devices that we're going to carry around are going to change the way people consume information and the way they contribute to information. Fascinating. And I'll have it up here if anybody wants to see it up close. <laughs> yeah. but I, ca I carried it everywhere we went today. <laughs> the people I was with at lunch, like, you're carrying that. Yes, I am. <laughs> All right. How we do? Oh, we're doing well on time. We're doing well. OK. Stand on our core values. Let's go back to LIS 701, which I teach at Dominican. We should let our core values guide everything we do. Who knew that stewardship, that used to look like this, could now look like this? And this is uh, Cornell University's digital collection on Flickr. Who knew? Service used to look like this and still does. But it also can look like this, using Twitter to serve the public. DCPL says, hey, can I help you with your question about the library to someone that has tweeted about it? Access looks like this. But it can also look like this. And this is Duke University's iPhone app. And built into the iPhone app is a little button that says images. And it's their digital collection. I was able to search the word dog. Was able to search their digital collection. Unfortunately named dog, his name is Wart. But there he is. Look at how sweet he is. That is part of their collection. And guess what? It is not up the way in the library. It is here in my hand. What did the bartender say? I have a world of information in my hand. Intellectual freedom. All those issues we talk about with books. And that is ongoing, too. But then we're dealing with things like Google and China as well. It is amazing. And literacy and learning. Uh, of course, this, and now we have connected classrooms. Seton Hall just said every student will receive an iPad when they come in the door. Seton Hall or Seton Hill? I've heard both. I really think we're moving to a time of reflective practice, of, of being, of standing with those core values. And I teach this stuff, and I am, I'm very serious about it, but also looking at new ways to do what we've always done, extending the library. And that's what Buckland said, and some of the other folks we saw when we start. Play, learn, and innovate. This is some of my favorite stuff, play. Play is important. Uh, great blog post from Idea Champion said, if you're not having fun, something is off. What we do should be kind of fun. Libraries should be fun. Uh, Henry Jenkins in Confronting the Challenges of Participatory Culture, and I should have told you everything is cited down here. The slides will go up on SlideShare as soon as I get connected again. Jenkins defined play as the capacity to experiment with one's surroundings as a form of problem solving. We should be playing with this stuff. Which leads me to Learning 2.0. And I want to take just one minute and tell you about one of my research projects. Learning 2.0 was conceived at the Public Library of Charlotte Mecklenburg uh, in the summer of 2006. And I was incredibly lucky to be invited down there to speak on the day that they launched the program. And the librarian running the show, her name was Helen Blowers. And she was actually in Holland with me doing some library stuff there as well, very much because of this. Uh, what I have done uh, in the last, it's almost been a year, is I've been working with a consortium of libraries in Australia, looking at the impact of learning 2.0 programs on libraries. Because there really has not been, beyond the here's how we did it good article you might find in the literature, any research. I asked folks, since the program, what, have you, what, what has been like the state of affairs in your library? And this is a wordle of some of the responses. Uh, increased awareness, better communication, uh, increased use, confidence, and helping uh, patrons or each other. And I actually went into the project and wrote the research proposal saying, 
This is, this is gonna show that libraries are changed and organizational culture has changed, and guess what? I was wrong. It's much more of a personal change. What we're finding is the people that are reporting out, we have a massive data set, is folks are saying it has helped me with my personal professional practice, it has helped me be a better employee, I feel more confident, I feel more aware in staff meetings when people are talking about the Foursquare or the Twitter or whatever. It becomes much more of a personal thing, and then I think we could bring it all the way back to, yes, that is benefiting the, the culture of the library. Here's uh, another Wordle uh, asking people, uh, what, what do you think uh, post-learning 2.0 has been the, one of the most important things that, that has happened? Uh, again, confidence, new library technologies, huge, gigantic words. The more you see these, of course, in a word cloud, the more they're used. Uh, it's fascinating, it's ongoing. We, we did a, a conference paper a couple months ago, and there'll be uh, some more articles up and coming. One of the things the program highlights is this idea of self-directed exploration. That you sit down for 20 minutes or 30 minutes a week and you, you learn about blogs, you learn about Twitter. What I've seen in looking at job descriptions for librarians, and some of you may even write a job description like this after tonight, is it actually spelled out that we want a library employee that will come in and do a job and be self-directed? Because we don't have time to hover over employees anymore. We, everybody has to do their stuff. So this is actually a skill, and this is something I think we should be teaching in library school, is to be very self-directed and to say, yeah, I can take this on, and to play. So, one thing you can do is you can actually tap into your personal learning network. And I was at Rutgers last fall doing a talk very similar to this one, and I had some time, I was connected to the Wi-Fi, so I said to my followers on Twitter, what should I tell the students tonight? How many students do we have here tonight? A couple, three? Oh, yay, okay. So this is for you all. This is what they said. Uh, here's uh, Jen Min Tracy. Uh, she said, read trade literature. There are many good ideas, and it helps keep you enthused. Uh, Ruby Beth, a former student of mine, be flexible and curious and uh, get a really good recommendation letter. <laughs> Indeed, okay. <laughs> That's funny. Michelle McLean, chiming in from Australia, says be open to new ideas, new technologies, new ways of doing things, and remember it's for your users. So what I did in a rainy, cold afternoon in New Jersey was I reached out to this group of people that happened to follow me on Twitter and I got stuff back from them, from all over the world. And you can do this too. As a student, for sure, as a library employee, as a director, absolutely. Tap into your personal learning network. Tell them that working the circulation desk will be the best training for the ref test they can get. <laughs> Yay. Uh, I love this. Rebecca Jones from Canada, be curious. Uh, think about the broad contacts and laugh. Laugh. She says, L-A-F-F, -F. I love that. This guy got in on my iPhone right under the wire and I got to put it into the presentation. Analyze user experience in your personal world and apply it to the library. Think about the favorite places you go where you have good customer service or you feel super comfortable. Why am I the mayor of Panera Bread in two locations? I go there a lot for good iced tea, free Wi-Fi, and a nice place to sit. And who knew that something as silly as Twitter, where that started with tell us in 140 characters, what are you doing exactly, would actually become a way to learn. And it's true, and I see it happening with my students in class and us talking to each other. What are you learning? What's the secret ingredient to all of this? Uh, it's trust. I really believe that. Trust is the most important ingredient. We need to trust our users. We need to trust each other. I believe I should trust my students. I believe in a high degree of radical trust from my students. I give them all the tools. I give them some things to experiment with. And I say, go forth. And you come back and you tell me about it. Trust. So think about the coolest things that you could change at your library. What are the little teeny weeny changes you could make right now? It might be going around your library and taking down some of those signs, because guess what? Probably nobody would even notice. <laughs> And think about what big changes you might be able to make. 
if I've done anything in the, the time that I've been running my mouth about libraries in the last few years, I've, I, I, I like this the best. I've said I believe we should encourage the heart. I think that's the most important thing we should do in libraries, and that really speaks to our mission. Uh, everything we do should be for the user and to encourage them and to help them be better people and to satisfy their curiosity. If you ask me about the library of the future, I see it's a space where people will be able to connect, collaborate, and create stuff. And we're already seeing that in libraries. And I see it as a place where we will care very greatly. Greatly. So how can we go forward? Here's some stuff just to think about. And then, yay, we can go to the reception. <laughs> Break down the barriers. Don't raise your hand. Are you a roadblock to getting things done in your library? Don't be. Look at your policies. See what you can change. Plan to plan. Take that first little bit of time. Not long. Don't have a year of meetings to talk about your social media policy. But just take a meeting and talk about what you're going to do. And promote the core values. Don't say, oh, we need a blog, we need a Twitter, we need a Foursquare right now. But think about how that might help the mission of the library and how it might come back to what we do in libraries. Evaluate everything you do. And you know what? That's the thing we're, we're starting to figure out right now. Looking for a research project? Look at how libraries can evaluate this stuff, because really, we don't know. It is all so new. How could you even begin to understand what Foursquare or location-aware environments like that might mean for libraries, because it's only been around for a handful of whatever? Remember that play equals learning. So sit down. Maybe if I've talked about something tonight, they're like, I haven't used that before. Load it up on the phone or get in front of the web and try it out. And develop your own personal learning network. Use the Twitter. Grab some blog feeds. You know, pull them into Google Reader or whatever. And sort of create this space where you're going to have uh, people telling you about neat stuff and kind of sharing their thoughts. And maybe do your own uh, sharing as well and participate. This is one of the best things you can do, especially as a student. Watch the horizon as well. What's the next thing? Is it, is it this device? Is it something that's going to be between the phone and the iPad? I don't know. But watch the horizon for the next thing. We missed out on what Amazon did. And we missed out on what Google did. But we can certainly find our way to uh, the next thing. OK, cheesiest slide in the talk. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> but really, be nimble, be quick. Be able to move as quickly as you can. Gigantic library systems can't move very quickly. Little baby library systems, they can move quick, quickly. Try to do this. Have three meetings instead of 20. Can you tell I don't like meetings? <laughs> no, it's OK to fail. It is OK. The gamers have taught us this. I'm, I'm gaming, I'm doing my, oh, I made a mistake. I back up a little bit and I go a different way. I would like to see a conference. You know, we go to our conferences and we begin the how we did it good stuff. I want to see a conference track devoted to how we messed up and what we learned from it. And I think there's actually going to be one out in Monterey this fall, the, the fail track, how we failed, really. I want somebody to get it, because you know, librarians, we don't want to kind of show off that we messed up, because everything we do has to be perfect, right? It's OK if you can say, yeah, I learned from this. And here's what I learned, and here's how we're doing it better next time. And have fun. Have fun with this stuff. Again, if you're not having fun, uh, find a way to do so. Look for the connections that you can make be between people. And right now, it just happens to be all about the wires and the devices and the checking in and the tweeting and all of that. But really, again, when it all falls away, it's this. And Clay Shirky said, when the technology gets boring, that's when it gets really, really interesting. So look for this part. And involve your users every single step of the way. Help, let them help you decide what to do. Ask them. Ask them again. Keep asking them. And trust them. Uh, Trust them to do OK in the spaces you provide and to mess with your collections. I was in Germany three weeks ago, kind of doing a, a bit of this talk. And a lady raised her hand. She said, we could never put our collection online because it wouldn't be ours anymore. I said, well, <laughs> if you put it online, it gets to more people. And isn't that what the collection is for? Trust them. It doesn't, don't those hangers make you crazy? 
<laughs> the Clarion, where I'm staying, has these. And it's so hard to steam your shirt, because you know, I like to steam my shirt in the bathroom. You can't hang it on anything without that. And be human. I, I want to hear about you. I want to hear about you being on the floaty and being found. If you're blogging for your library, bring your own take to it. Bring your humanity. Again, let the technology fall away and let it be this. And be kind. Let's be nice to each other and be nice to our users. Think about the signs we put up. And balance. <laughs> okay. I wish I could say that was Cooper, but it's not. For 50 minutes, I've been blah, blah, blah with technology at you. But let me say this. Look for that balance, too. Turn it off. Guess what? The Twitter is going to be there tomorrow. And if you miss 100 tweets, who cares? OK? It's all right. Turn things off, step away, go outside. Because it really will help you with the balance, and it'll help you come back with a fresh mind. Uh, I heard someone at a conference, say a business conference, say, we need to bring our hearts with us to work, you know, business, blah, blah. And I thought, you know, we've always done that in libraries. And that's probably why a lot of us found our way to libraries, right? Because we wanted to bring our hearts with us. We wanted to make a difference. We wanted to serve people. Remember this. Bring your heart with you and let the heart drive change. That's the human part, that human connection that we're seeking to make. And to give people what they need, let the heart drive change. OK, the last thing I'm going to say, and then we'll be done. This is the uh, zigzag bridge in uh, Sydney, Australia. Uh, very beautiful, beautiful space. And down here in the corner, there was a little plaque you could read about what it means. And it really illustrates what, I, what I'm trying to say is for you all to go forward and to go and have a meeting and maybe debrief this night or, or talk about your next project. You start out on the zigzag bridge, and you take a few steps, and then you turn. And what do you do? You change your point of view. And you go forward a little bit, and then you turn again. Now, that's, I like that part. But the rest of the story, the rest of the story that the little plaque said is evil spirits don't know how to make the turns, so they will not follow you. <laughs> I know. So think about fear that kind of gets in our way. Oh, we couldn't do that because the users will do something bad with our content. Or there'll be a dirty word on the library blog. Don't let the evil spirits creep up behind you. Think about the zigzag bridge. Yay, we made it. Yay, thank you. Here's my contact information. Oh, we're doing well with time. Any thoughts or comments or questions or concerns? Uh, was there a back channel? Anybody tweeting while I was talking? Anybody tweeting? <laughs> Yay! I love the back channel. I encourage it. How y'all doing? James. Um, I'd like to know your personal opinion of, and your perspective on ebooks and how libraries will be able to, you know, what are we going to do with the Kindles, the iPads? Are we going to loan them out? Are we going to provide access to e-books? What, what's your personal take on it? OK, my personal take right now, and I think it's an ongoing changing opinion, I think we should circulate these. I, I think that's one way that we can fight the digital divide. Because not ever, nobody can, not, not the, wor the world can't go out and buy one of these right now. So if we can put one in somebody's hand and load it up with some books and some videos and whatever from, that the library purchases. I think that's a really good thing. Now, the, the, real, the reality is, in my mind, Netflix and iTunes have gone past us. And I don't think we're not, we're not coming back. I really believe that. The direct-to-consumer, you know, talking with the bartender earlier, he played a song. I'm like, that's the best song ever. I bought it on my phone, like that. I didn't say, oh, I'll make a note, and I'll go to the library, and I'll get the CD, and I'll maybe I'll rip the CD or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, I buy the song for 99 cents. You make something easy to use. This is a lot of fun. I'm enjoying this. You make something easy to use, and people want to use it. Now, what I, the role I see the library playing is gathering that local content and providing an outlet for people that want to publish. Maybe I want to write 
short stories that I'm going to give to the library that the library might put out on a device like this or make downloadable, and that becomes part of the library's collection. So while all the blockbuster movies are streaming to your TV, and I think that's the way it's going to be, because Netflix, their name isn't mail something to your home flicks, it's Netflix, yeah. That, the library will be serving out local content, content created in the library, and all those things that we can make deals about. I think it'll be the little stuff. It'll be the long tail stuff, if you read Chris Anderson, that kind of thing. That's my take. Uh, I'm trying to decide what book to buy from the Apple, the iBooks. I haven't decided yet, but I'm going to buy one. You should see the way the page turns on that, compared to the Kindle, which is a little not as beautiful <laughs> on this. I think we should circulate the devices. I think we should look for ways to offer local content. Thank you. That was a good question. Other questions or comments or thoughts? So the yeah. Panero that you have that you're the mayor of. Yes. <laughs> so I was in Charlotte yesterday, and I was uh, thinking about the libraries uh, losing business. So why can't, uh, if, the, if the public libraries are laid off in Charlotte, why can't they uh, just like a, a bar will hire a band to draw people come to their bars, right. hire a good public librarian who's really into the web as a, as a way to uh, bring people in and uh, have access to information. I couldn't agree more. And play your favorite song with, oh, with the speaker. I know. I know. There was a librarian in New York State that was doing that. As part of his weekly reference duty, he would go to Panera Bread for two to three hours. And he had a sign that said, the librarian is here. He would hand out library card applications, and he would do reference on his laptop. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know what happened, though? He told me finally. He said, well, administration changed, and they won't let me leave the building anymore. Yeah. I think that's outreach. You don't need the four walls of the library to be the library. Absolutely, at the cafe, at the train station, anywhere that we could put some type of library presence, I think we should. I love that idea. The, those Charlotte Mecca, they should absolutely go to the, the Panera, and they could help the Panera cause as well. Not the library. Yeah, sure. It's yeah. The it's the band. They are the largest provider, I think this is right, of free Wi-Fi in the United States. Wouldn't that be wonderful to have a librarian on duty? <laughs> It'd be great. I've done, you know, you, you know, as a librarian, you listen to people. And somebody at the table, well, well what goes into haggis, somebody said. Oh, haggis. And I'm like, looking it up, you know. I can, t I can well, they'll know I'm eavesdropping if I give them the answer to the question. That's inherent in us, that we want to answer people's question. So it makes perfect sense to be at the cafe or wherever and be, yeah, I can help you. Ask me a question. We should wear a big sign. Let's put the speaker with the microphone. Absolutely. Absolutely. Other thoughts, questions? Talk about more ideas about local content. What do you think? Uh, local stories, local collections, anybody in town that's famous, vaguely famous, the library should work to build that stuff because that's very unique to that setting. Uh, anything and everything that sort of divine, defines the community. And that community might be the campus, it might be the town, it might be whatever. Because I think it's broader than just the public library. Anything and everything. And the, the library in, in Delft, is, it, to me, is a perfect example of that. They're gathering everything they can find about the history of the town, and they're making that part of the library experience. And I, you could walk in that library, and you could feel it. It was used. It was exciting. And, and technology was just one, one layer of it all. Yes? When the library is restricted to just four walls, how do you suggest we attract all of these young technophiles? <laughs> oh, that, good question. Give them a comfortable place to sit. Give them something to drink, preferably with caffeine, free Wi-Fi, and don't put a bunch of rules on them. And try to find some sort of passionate young people that use the library and sort of build, uh, use Seth Godin's word, build the tribe that way. Uh, you want to find a way to connect people. Oak Park Public Library in, in uh, Illinois has a 20-something, 30-something book club where they read a, a selected title. They don't even meet in the library. They meet at a bar down the street. But they know it's the library. And then they have events at the library as well. It's fascinating. I saw another hand, too. Yes? It wasn't Hi. One, but I, I did want to sort of follow up on that. The, um, 
Thomas Cooper Library over here, when I started library school, nobody would go there. It was, it was very quiet. You yeah. always study. Yeah. <laughs> Recently, they've taken the signs down, they've allowed mm -hmm. Drix to come in, they've provided better places, and the security guard I talked to the other night said they're getting eight to 10,000 students a day. Oh, that's great. Thomas it's, to, it's open 24-7, mm -hmm. and so that is sort of the model. It follows along directly with what's yeah. the Yeah. There's probably space over there for them to sit together, collaborate. A billion outlets, both, and f for your question as well, a billion outlets because everybody's carrying around something they're going to need to plug in. Yeah, that's, that's a nice story. Thank you. Just, just yeah. to let you know, I work over at Thomas Cooper. Oh, nice. And we redid our computer lab mm -hmm. and took away the rows of computers. Nice. We have them around the outside, but we try for mostly wireless, but it's connectivity and it's post and beam. Movable chairs, movable tables, this type of thing, because we want the kids to move the furniture how they need it. That's good. <laughs> and you know, it doesn't hurt anything, does it? Not so far. <laughs> you know, where, where, what happened to us on the road where we said, oh, we can't let anybody touch our furniture in our libraries? What happened? It's amazing. Any other thoughts? Yes. On, on the localization of libraries and, and hyper-localization, yes. this, this, this is also uh, a, a theory that's running around the news organizations. It's right up. Newspapers probably will do best at surviving if they become even more local mm -hmm. so that they're not being drowned out by networks and, and the internet in, in some ways. Does the library, by becoming a, a hyper-local resource for information compete with or collaborate with the media? Collaborate. How? Uh, any way they can. Any, in offering space, physical and virtual space, maybe for people to meet and to talk, for the citizen journalist to check in if it's going that route. Uh, that's, boy, that's a good question. I, I think it would be more collaboration. I would have to give that a little more thought. But uh, I would agree that that I think that'd be a good partnership. Just like we should partner with schools, absolutely. Partner with the... The extension of that is you're going to contribute to putting journalists out of work. Mm. The more citizens... <laughs> <don't>. <laughs> yeah. It, it is, it's fascinating. I did a blog post two years ago about canceling my newspaper subscription because it just went into the recycling bin every day. Sorry. I actually, I was on a blog, I was called the, the poster child for the death of the newspaper <laughs> industry. <laughs> but I found because I can pull in to my info world and the, both of these devices now, feeds that they put out, the newspaper and the, the news stations, that's how I want my news. So I think finding the the balance of that, where we are going to have the authoritative reporting coming in and make that available in the channels that me or whoever. And, and the, the, the iPad's fascinating because it, I, I read USA Today this morning at breakfast on that. I walked past the little stack in the breakfast room because I had that. And that, that was like another moment of like, hmm, what's this mean? Uh, so there'll be that. And then we'll have our citizen journalists probably being very hyper local, like almost block by block. Don't miss this great restaurant. Here's a cool store type thing. That's, and that's fascinating stuff. And I'm not speaking very well to it, but it's, it's intriguing. Yes? I have a dream. You know that. I run our, uh, our project in the second line. Mm -hmm. I always think that there is a great chance that our students of the whole college, not just our school, but the whole college mm -hmm. can work together. That kind of collaboration. Absolutely. And in our sister school, there are training report journalists. They are they they really needed to access evidence, information, those reliable resources in order to enhance their work. What if they can work with our students, and our students can in that can in that the virtual environment can work with those 
those people who will have great potential to be great reporters mm -hmm. can work with them and help them access the evidence. I, and I really hope to see that. That's, that's, a, that's a good idea, absolutely. That is the collaboration yeah. that I wanted to see and really see that information specialists can work in every environment. And they are interact in human homes. Absolutely, and really. And that's how I, I hope I can see. In library school, I think we should be teaching our students how to collaborate and how to reach out to the, the various places we should in town, the schools, you the media, etc. Absolutely. It doesn't matter the environment or location; they can be everywhere. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.